Okay, so this is a, a real pleasure to be with, uh, with all of you, uh, whatever you are. Um, we've been actually talking with the people behind the scene and how incredible, you know, this uh, few days of having so many incredible people, people who are actually on the ground, who are everywhere in the world, uh, trying to do their part, companies, a civil society, all coming together to show actually that we can change things. And, you know, for the ocean part, it is extremely important. We have to recognize the ocean is not just this big amount of water, but it's actually the place where life comes from. And I'm very happy to be here with all of you. My name is Max Bello. Maximiliano, I'm from Chile, and um, I've been working on marine conservation for a few years, and I have been experiencing uh, some of the most beautiful memories and, you know, things that could ever um, be the best sort of uh, uh, memories for life, uh, to basically then remember uh, every day, why do I care? Why we should be uh, caring about the ocean and why do we care about the uh, changing what we have been done on climate change. It's affecting the ocean, but the ocean also have um, something very uh, important. It might be the key also for solving these issues. And that's uh, why we've been talking today about the nature-based solutions. As you see, and you will see, you can go into the Slido. We are uh, live streaming now. And so you can go into Slido and you can be part of this conversation too. You can actually send your questions there or your comments, you know, um, how happy you are to see all of these people here. We have an incredible uh, group of people who have been actually working um, every day, every single hour, day and night to actually save this planet. Um, there's no better way to say it. So um, you can actually then go into Race to Zero in a Slido and, or scan the, uh, the, the code, and then you can uh, be part of this. We're gonna be reviewing this. We're gonna see your, your uh, questions and we're gonna be asking those questions if we can to uh, the panelists that you want to talk with. Um, I'm, I want to start, and, I, and I'm very proud of um, also presenting um, Minister Alaman, who uh, I know for many years, actually, uh, we, we used to live in the same region even um, years ago when he was also a senator in the, uh, what is today the region of the rivers in the south of Chile, a beautiful, probably the most beautiful region in Chile. I know people are going to say differently. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I've seen um, that how he cares about the ocean, how he cares about environment. Um, he's uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Chile. He's been also working uh, hard on, on many issues, among them uh, Antarctica, Antarctica protection, which is a key element also for uh, marine conservation and for climate change in general. So. Um, Minister Alaman, um, it's a pleasure to see you always and seeing you here. Uh, and please, uh, you can start this, uh, this conversation. I'm, I'm proud of having you here. Thanks. Hello, Max. Hello, everybody. Uh, dear organizers, uh, ocean leaders and advocators, please receive my warmest uh, regards. It's really a pleasure to share opening remarks in this important event. Allow me for the outset to congratulate the high level champions from Chile and the UK, Gonzalo Muñoz and Nigel Topping for leading the organization of the Race to Zero events and for recognizing the crucial role of the ocean in climate action. Indeed, the ocean plays a fundamental role in our lives. The ocean covers 70% of the planet, providing us with countless environmental benefits and supporting millions of people around the world. The ocean has a fundamental role as global climate regulator, being responsible for capturing about a third of the anthropogenic CO2 emitted into the atmosphere and for absorbing about 90% of the additional heat 
resulting from global warming. While it provides us with great benefits and ecosystem services, the ocean also confronts great threats, which include illegal and unregulated fishing, the effects of climate change and marine pollution by plastics, which directly disrupt our societies and our communities, causing a progressive deterioration of the ocean environment. Specifically, in terms of climate change, the ocean suffers acidification, deoxygenation, and sea level rise, among other processes, creating many existential threats to communities and livelihoods around the world. For Chile, the ocean is a central foundation of our national identity. With a coastline of more than 4,000 kilometers, the ocean is crucial for our culture, society, environment, and economy. In line with this, Chile has assumed its responsibility in the protection and sustainability of the ocean and its resources. In recent years, Chile has created new marine protected areas, which now covers 43% of our jurisdictional waters, equivalent to more than 1.6 million square kilometers. Chile has also introduced the ocean as a focus of the climate discussion, as a reflection of our national policies. For example, the new Chilean National, national Determined Contribution, NDC, includes an ocean component with commitments for both mitigation and adaptation. We have promoted the idea that all countries should also include robust ocean components in their NDCs, covering both mitigation and adaptation. It is crucial that we join forces and share experiences about our policies and good practices. Solutions to the climate crisis in the ocean must be built, taking into consideration the local perspective. As we protect ecosystems, we are also protecting the sustainability of our societies and particularly the communities that depend on the ocean, including indigenous people. These topics will be also explored in the ocean and climate dialogue that was mandated at COP25 under the presidency of Chile. The dialogue to take place in a virtual format next two and three of December will provide the opportunity to take the first step in a formal space on this crucial matter. Considering the great attention, attention and expectations that the dialogue has attracted, we, now, we know that it will be not the last. COP26 in Glasgow will need to look into this discussion and make sure that countries have the means to continue discussing and developing tools and identifying opportunities to protect the ocean to the adverse consequences of climate change in the context of their NDCs and the implementation of the, implementation of the Paris, Paris Agreement. 2020 will be marked by COVID, but also by how governments and the world are taking action to recover in a holistic way, taking into account social, environmental, and economic aspects. In this context, we must reflect on how we incentivize action, including through public-private partnerships to protect and restore marine ecosystems and strengthen ocean resilience to ensure a healthy ocean for the future of humanity. I wish you a successful event and please count on Chile for contributing in this important debate. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to you, Minister Alaman. This is, uh, it is great to, to see you and, and to speak with those words um, words of example, because Chile has been doing an incredible job on, as you said, protecting the ocean, um, mobilizing everyone in the same uh, way to actually take care of what we have 84, I think it is, a thousand kilometers square long if you count all the islands and everything. It is an impressive place. I also want to thank uh, the, the, the Chilean government for bringing uh, on the COP25 the oceans as one of the key elements, but also I want to thank today to the WEF who have been providing incredible platform and in particular the people that are behind there. I want to say thank you to Elena who we've been working hardly on this for a long time uh, already. And I want to thank the, the champions, the champions who have bring uh, so much ambition. It's been growing, Nigel and Gonzalo, as the minister said, incredible people. And we have also many incredible people talking to, to uh, today in this panel. And, uh, and I wanna start presenting some of them. 
Uh, I'm very happy to have uh, Mother Sar um, uh, giving us and she is um, from Palau, uh, a beautiful country who uh, also have done incredible job on trying their best to protect the ocean, their best to protect their culture, um, the, 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 in the link they have with the ocean is incredible, all the stories and everything that is around that and the, the political power to, that have been put into this small country in the middle of the ocean who have actually fought a, a huge uh, fight. No, and uh, to, to protect this, uh, this beautiful part of their, their, uh, their, their, their soul, basically. Um, she has been working with the communities in, in Palau. She's been working also in innovation and possibilities to finance also more uh, sustainable um, use uh, in livelihoods and also for um, uh, accelerating, you know, the, the protection of this ecosystems. She's been studying in, in different universities of the United States, in Washington State University and University of California in San Diego, and she have an incredible uh, resume. I'm very, I'm very proud to, uh, for her to, to having her here. Um, then I'm gonna, I want to um, introduce to um, uh, Brendan Pasisi, who's uh, actually will be joining at a certain point uh, of the conversation. He been, he's been having some issues. He's from uh, New and so there's a little bit of a shortage and uh, energy shortage there. And so we will be potentially not already there. Uh, I think it is maybe already there back. Yeah, Brendan, um, good to see you here too. Um, he's a very proud uh, father and, um, and, and, and a husband too. He's a marine biologist and he's been working in the government and also in the private sector for um, a good fishing, for sustainable fishing um, in Niue, who actually also another country who's been giving incredible uh, 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 examples of, or examples of uh, this um, uh, conservation of the ocean. We also have Alex Perry. Alex Perry is a, is a, is a good friend and it's very um, incredible active person who's uh, uh, constantly, you know, talking uh, with the uh, grassroots groups, uh, not just in the United States, but also in the, uh, in the whole region of Latin America, um, from the Patagonia company who, you know, have an incredible um, uh, commitment with not just with the uh, with with the environment itself, ocean, land, uh, protected areas, and everything, but also with what they are they are doing. They they make clothes, but they they make they they make sure that actually it's clothes that have uh, the the lowest impact possible. And so they are thinking more holistically, actually how to also invest on on people. So he's an an outdoorsy person for sure good runner, good surfer. Um, and so pleasure to having you here, Alex. Uh, I'm, I'm, very, I'm very glad that we're together in this. Um, I want to introduce also to Enric Sala. Enric Sala, you all know, he um, just published a, an incredible book to uh, The Nature of Nature. Um, I think it's, it's more like a letter, no, Enric, that a, a letter for nature. Uh, from you and for you, from your work. Uh, he's a uh, National Geographic Explorer in residence and he also directed the program Pristine Seas who actually also have been part of this incredible movement to accelerate marine protected areas creation around the world. And in particular also, you know, thinking about this 30 by 32 and, and how do we get there also with strong, high, uh, highly and fully protected areas, which is a very important surname for Marine protected areas and for that thirty percent. Um, so you know him for for TV and it's an incredible explorer and scientist. He just uh, good um, uh, papers that he just published with other uh, scientists and Rick. And so maybe we can talk about that too. So good to having you here too. Um, and then I'm gonna go with Sylvia Earl. We we gonna um, we're gonna do the uh, this uh, short because you 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 don't need much presentation. Uh, her deepness, as they call, uh, they call her, uh, she's going to be giving us uh, some remarks at the end of the conversation. Uh, Sylvia, it's always a great pleasure to having you here and to, uh, to be working with you uh, pretty much every day. 
and then uh, WRI people to Sophie Wood and others that, that are joining us to and again for the WEF and the champions uh, team to to be here uh, together. Remember, you can go to Slido and when you go to Slido hashtag race to zero and you can put your questions your comment um, anything you want, please um, go and participate. Be part of this conversation. You should be part of this conversation. Um, it, it's good that we are all connected um, and we are hoping you're interested on, on, on this topic for sure. You should be because the ocean, it's probably the most important topic that we should be talking every day in our life. Um, I, I want to start with you, Enrique, um, talking about those papers that you just uh, published. I think it is very key what you've been doing in terms of trying to bring also economics into, into the equation. Um, we've seen the wardroom uh, study uh, just not long ago, uh, like a month ago. Uh, now also some related with, with fisheries and also uh, food security, etc. Um, we're always, when we're working, and I know you probably get the same questions too, uh, we are normally trying to find a balance, no? And, and I think uh, between protection and extraction, uh, how effective um, is that balance? What do, you, what do you think? How effective that balance could be? Or is there a balance between these two parts or is it just a myth? Well, thank you, Max, and hello, everyone. We are out of balance uh, with nature, and the balance is in favor of exploitation. And today, less than 3% of the ocean is fully protected, which means that 97% of the ocean is open to fishing, oil drilling, mining, and other damaging activities. So if we have to uh, have a balance, sure, let's have a balance. You know, what about 50-50? No, that would, be, that would be a balance. And there is also a myth that we cannot protect more of the ocean because we have to uh, catch more fish to feed uh, 10 billion people that are coming. But, you know, the, we reached peak catch in 1995, which means the fish stocks have been declining globally for 25 years. 82% uh, of the fish stocks are overfished, which means that we are taking them out of the water faster than they can reproduce. So we are not going to get more fish by fishing more. You know, and there are some local fisheries that are well managed using traditional knowledge. There are some industrial fisheries, very few that are not depleting the stocks, but most of them, 82%, are overfished. So the solution to get more fish is not fish more, it's actually fish less and create no take areas, these highly and fully protected areas that you were mentioning, Max. And the science is very clear. The science is telling us that to restore marine life, no take areas are the most effective thing. If you don't kill the fish, they take a longer time to die, they grow larger, they produce many, many more eggs and help to replenish uh, themselves and the areas around them, which also helps local fisheries because local fishermen are doing better in places where they have no take areas that help to replenish the, their fishing grounds. And also in some of these areas, uh, ecotourism brings, helps to create jobs and brings in economic revenue that is much greater than, than business as usual. So not take areas have ecological, social, and economic benefits. The idea that we can have protected areas where we allow fishing and that is going to be sustainable is the same as not creating these protected areas. So the science and the economics are very clear in that regard. Thank you so much. That is, you know, it, it is crazy to think about that it's about like 2.9 percent that is probably protected uh, only and and highly and fully which is the the areas that actually can deliver no uh, what we need really for um for conservation uh, meaning and you said it so well you know more than 97 percent it is actually for for selling uh, I mean, let's put it like that no and that's that's very that's a you know, kind of change your mind about what are we really doing and, and the efforts of conservation that we need to accelerate to. And, and I want to, uh, you know, uh, going to Madalsar, because you're coming from, from Palau, which actually did an incredible job on, on, on protecting a huge part of the, uh, of the economic exclusive zone. And 
so then you have uh, you know some more of the example and you've been working through this too how difficult could be that kind of different views so the question is what is needed then to ensure that conservation efforts and to make them effective in from your point of view from from what you guys have been doing there Thank you, Max. Um, I just want to pay respects to Minister Aman and all the organizers and thank you for this opportunity. Um, so just some background. I uh, work with um, a nonprofit organization, One Reef Worldwide Stewardship. We're based in Micronesia, uh, the Northern Pacific, and we work with uh, many community partners. And so from our perspective, I think um, effective conservation really uh, requires um, equitable partnerships with um, island communities, indigenous folks who have relied on the ocean and the environment um, for their very survival. And there are a lot of traditional knowledge and practices embedded in their cultures that um, perhaps we can learn from and combine these with um, science, technology, and conservation investment to really make a stronger impact on conservation initiatives. Um, I've worked for many years in various capacities with other nonprofit organizations. And, you know, after about 15 years in this sector, I've wondered, you know, what is it that it you know, isn't making the big impact that our communities are really um, striving for. And I think a lot of it has been this top down approach where, you know, there's a lot of great intentions with donor funding coming through these communities towards ocean conservation. Um, however, uh, perhaps there are misguided um, approaches to these initiatives. And I think many of the communities, indigenous peoples who um, live in ocean spaces actually have had a very clear understanding of these environments and ecosystems and how to um, come close to balance, I think is what en Enrique is saying. And um, embedded within their, their cultural practices are systems and processes for carrying these types of um, conservation efforts out. So, what Palau has done in terms of establishing a, a national marine sanctuary is nothing new um, from you know, our, our perspective. We've had um, what we call a bull. Um, this is uh, similar to a moratorium that we would see in, in other places where our chiefs would designate specific areas, MPAs, no take zones, or they would um, designate certain species off limits. Um, when they have noticed perhaps a shortage or um, a decrease in, in stock. So these things that um, have been in place for indigenous communities are really critical for us to consider in the larger scheme of ocean protection. And I think um, that's one of the things that One Reef has really tried to harness and um, perhaps combine with other partnerships and networks external to these island spaces. Thank you so thank you so much for your answer. I um, you know I, I think one of one of the things always when I when I am talking with people about marine protected areas actually um, it seems to be like a, the new idea. But going to Palau, going to Polynesia, you know, there there are some Rahu, the 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 the, the other kind of uh, ways to protect the resources and in areas have been in place for thousands of years. I mean, they have been proved again and again and again, and we keep proving it, you know, papers and books and everything. And some people still kind of keep saying, that, you know, that they don't believe on marine predictors. Well, there's extensive information and there's extensive information from Palau, from these countries and, and from New too, no? Um, and we have here the project director of the New Ocean White, uh, Project Brandon, thank you so much, and and also uh, Madal Sar. Before you, you're also I, I leave you. I thank you so much. You, it's like three a.m. in Palau right now. So thank you so much for connecting at this time of the of the in the middle of the night, basically. And uh, thank you so much for that. 
Brenda, it's so good to, to having you also because you, I know you've been having some issues with energy um, there, but I think it's good that we, we have you here and we have you right now. Uh, it must be also very um, late for you. So thank you so much. Brenda, uh, let me ask you, what is, one of, what is the, uh, the most difficult challenge that you've been facing? You know, management sometimes, it could be extremely difficult. People think that, you know, it's kind of like, okay, you put it in place, you kind of like grade, uh, write a, uh, um, a law or something and it's done. But it's so much more than that. Tell us, what is the biggest challenge you've been facing on managing resources? Yeah, well, thank you and uh, good morning, actually. It's, uh... It's, it's okay, the time is good here. It's the morning here in uh, Niue. Um, the challenge has been the energy, as you say, the island is experiencing shutdowns from north to south. So apologies for coming in late, but um, I'm really glad to be here and to contribute towards this really uh, important and, and exciting uh, meeting today. Um, I think, yeah, um, the challenges that we have, usually um, there's national uh, level challenge, obviously to the governments and uh, revenues dealing with issues like uh, energy as we're experiencing this morning and, and health and all those other things. But I think, um, so they have a national interest in terms of using the, the ocean uh, space and resources. Uh, and then you also have the um, communities who rely on the, um, the immediately adjacent uh, ocean and resources uh, for them. And so I think um, the challenges that we've had really have been, um, first of all, working out what the status of those resource Design. I think we have a, a challenge where the, the new generations now are, are seeing a different baseline and, and when they come on board. And so um, trying to explain sort of where we've come from, um, we have a portion of the population that is, is more mature and are the ones who really are just telling the story about how it used to be. And then as we move forward now into the, the, the younger generations, the challenges are different. I think also um, just in terms of the, the cultural aspects, um, it's trying to understand uh, all the users who, who are using it and what they're using it for, how important it is for them. Um, also our cultural and traditional systems, um, I think that sort of look at it as, as being on a continuum um, where you have very strong traditional and cultural um, uh, and traditional uh, management and conservation measures you can utilize those um, very well. Uh, and I think um, earlier speakers have, have, have talked to that, but uh, I think where you're in transition, uh, everyone aspires to a higher standard of living. And, uh, and that means, uh, you know, food security, income generation and those sorts of things. So um, as we, we look at that, um, the change from the past to now in those traditional systems, we've been trying to put our finger on it and it's the technology. So in the past, some of those uh, traditional um, uh, methods of management stuff worked very well. Uh, they were using um, uh, more primitive sort of technology, I guess, in, in terms of fishing power uh, and resource uh, exploitation. Whereas now you have, uh, you know, they're quite simple things in some cases, but the technology now linked together with the very good uh, knowledge and experience um, of those cultural and traditional uh, systems means that um, they can actually exploit the resource as well. So it's a, it's a double-edged sword. And I, I guess coming back to um, uh, Enric's uh, um, point about balance, um, we also have to look sometimes in, inside the systems that we have. I think in places where um, you have very strong customary and, and, and traditional practices that still hold respect uh, and power that uh, works very well uh, in other um, systems similar to New Way where you have a transition and a focus to move to more what we know is more conventional Western um, uh, management systems with laws and, and regulations and, and, and rules like that. Um, it's trying to bring those two together uh, to get a balance that really works for, for everybody. Um, yeah, so I think, um, you know, and then after that, it's, it's about um, sustainable uh, resourcing of that. And so what we've looked at and tried to do something totally different for our case here in Niue is 
to actually try and find a sustainable uh, funding mechanism uh, because uh, two really important things is that communities, once you engage with them, they have to have resources uh, available in the timeframes that allows them to continue to do it. Uh, our failures in the past have been that we've gone in, engaged with them, they've been very interested and on board with doing it, but we haven't been able to maintain our presence and continue that. And so the same thing happens with large uh, projects externally. They come in, it does a great amount of work, um, and then it comes to an end. Uh, national governments aren't able to pick up the slack uh, and then it just stops. And uh, communities have many other challenges on their hands and so they will put it to the side. And if, if it's not a timely intervention and a sustained intervention, um, then uh, our experience is that it, it has a great challenges and, and been effective, thanks. Thank you. The, you, you touched on a couple of very uh, key elements, you know, how, how fast our societies are changing and how we can probably also use those things. I mean, like you said, it, the, the young people use technology that maybe, you know, um, older people might not know exactly how and maybe both together combining cultural knowledge and and, uh, and and these new technologies can can do a, a, a good a good work, and we've seen a lot of uh, new technology coming in to to help uh, dearly on on the conservation of the ocean. And so I, th I think that is that is a very key element. And then financing I, that's something that I always you know uh, we, we're thinking about how we actually bring more interest and more investment into ocean protection. There's, there's not enough. There was just a, a, a report on the Organization of Developed uh, Countries that uh, about one percent, less than 1% of the total budget of these countries are actually used on uh, conservation. And marine conservation are even much more, <laughs> less than that. So the, we, we have a huge gap in financing actually these activities, which brings uh, uh, quality of life, wealthy for some people, for, and, and for most people actually, for big communities that actually need that. So very, very important um, uh, things that you're mentioning. And, and I want to go with with Alex. Alex, you know, this is something that is struck me because it's also, um, you know, you don't see this very often. Um, companies don't invest that much on on the uh, on the future of, of of the earth, even though they're they're using all the resources of it. Um, and and you guys have been taking so much care of the you know the the the, the ocean and and the land. Why, why is it that? I mean, why, why you, you, Patagonia have taken that decision uh, to begin with? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think, um, you know, put most simply, we, we start off with the concept that there is no business on a dead planet. And from that concept, we go and uh, we built a mission statement. And our mission statement is to uh, save our home planet. Um, you know, we see, we see the degradation of the environment and we see uh, the ways that you know, marginalized communities are being affected most. And we, we see that the current system, especially in the private sector, the current uh, system of capitalism is a broken one. And frankly speaking, um, what we aim to do is, is really find ways to innovate and update. Uh, I love the conversation around technology and finding new ways that can not only cause the least amount of harm, but rather find ways to uh, to, toward a regenerative path to the environment. You know, one, one area that strikes me, you know, personally here is the work that we're doing um, to build products with uh, used and otherwise would be discarded fishing nets actually down on the coast of Chile. And so what we've done is partnered up with uh, local fishing communities. Um, and this is to your point about how we make, we, we really invest in it. And you know, we pay a premium, we buy fishing nets that would have been thrown away often just tossed out to sea or left on the coastline and the beaches. Um, and, and we turn that into products that we sell. And in fact, the, the hat I'm wearing, I wouldn't otherwise normally be wearing a hat, is made from old discarded fishing nets. And so as we look to reduce our own footprint, you know, what's something that Patagonia really looks toward, um, you know, and this is a message to all that are watching in the private sector, the, it's not necessarily just philanthropy. It's a true investment. There's a return on protecting the environment and in investing in conservation. 
And I think it's really up to us to find new business models. You know, I think it's easy to uh, come up with an excuse that, you know, quarterly earnings reports require us to return, you know, the most profit to shareholders. You know, that model is going to eviscerate the whole next generation of consumers. I mean, I think that the, the you know, what, what might seem revolutionary uh, to, to most, to us, is, is common sense. And so we're going to continue to find ways to invest in regenerative solutions to how we build product and, and how we're getting it to, to stores and to consumers um, so that ultimately then more people can go out and enjoy the outdoors, which is the industry that we're in. And so, uh, you know, finding new business models is, is something that is, is, is exciting to us and, and it frankly is the most commonsensical thing to do. Um, you know, they say that by 2050, a quarter of the, the world's carbon emission is going to come from the fashion industry, the clothing and apparel industry. You know, we have to we have to get ahead of that. Again, that's a quick way to have no more business to be done because the planet would be dead. And so finding ways to, you know, uh, create a business model around used clothing, around repairing clothing and giving more life to what you're using. Um, and those are the kind of notions that we often go back to and we, we rely on, um, and we hope that others start to begin to see. That is, that is a great example. I mean, I remember Yvonne Trinard, the CEO, once uh, in an article, he said, like, don't, don't buy another Patagonia jacket. They yeah. are so, they're so good that you don't have to buy another one because you actually can keep using it. I mean, the same CEO of the company kind of saying to people, don't buy just for buying, you know, like that is such a great example. And I remember even like uh, Patagonia went almost out of business when they decide to invest in new technology to transform bottles, plastic bottles into clothing. And, right. and, and to clothes. And, and that was that was incredible. I mean, like they 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 totally just say like, look, we're gonna do this. We're gonna do it right. right. If if we can't do it, like we're gonna go out of business. And I, I think that this example is so great. So thank you so much for for leading with with that example, um, Enrique. Um, you you are a scientist. Um, you 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 have um, I've seen. Oh, and before I, I go to you, reminding people, go into Slido again, please, and and answer one question. What is resilience for you? What is resilience for the ocean? What is resilience for communities? What is, re what is resilience for you? Um, so going back to, to Enrique, Enrique, so you've been uh, writing a huge amount of, of information for all of us to digest, for, for people to take the right decision to. Um, we are in a very weird time, no? I mean, uh, we, we used to see each other in different places, in different meetings around the world, and now we, we happen to see each other only by, by Zoom um, on this pandemic, this pandemic that we probably also, we, 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 we did it in a way, no? We, we caused it. Um, do you think we can learn something out of this crisis? Do you think there's something that we can maybe in the future use out of, uh, you know, um, out of learning, it's there the pandemic teaching us something? Um, please tell us. Yeah, I think that pandemic is teaching us two main things. Number one is that nature has an extraordinary ability to bounce back. People have been fascinated watching these videos at home of humpback whales coming into marinas or mountain lions coming into the streets of Santiago in Chile and many other examples. And this is a, a very powerful message from nature saying, look, if you give me some space, look at what I can do. And the second important thing that the pandemic has shown us is that we haven't been building for resilience. We've been building for growth, for hyper leveraged, unfettered growth, but not for resilience. And MPAs are a great example because many of them are dependent on economic revenue from tourism, but tourism went from whatever it was to zero during the, the lockdown. And countries like Ecuador or Mexico are cutting the budget of the national parks agencies. And they are using uh, the money for economic recovery to prop up the industries of the past, the, the uh, industries that destroy our life support system, instead of investing in industries that employ a lot of people and are the necessary condition for the support of many people, especially coastal communities that have high reliance on, 
or in a healthy ocean. So if we, if we have learned one thing for a government is when we build back, we need to build back better. We cannot go back to what was normal because we really don't want that. We need to be building back, thinking about how to build resilience, how to make communities more financially more resilient, which in turn will, will make this um, marine protected areas more resilient, creating this feedback loop where everybody benefits. That is, a, that is a good example. Uh, I've seen it too in, in several places in Latin America, you know, like going back now, like kind of, you know, people are struggling economically. That is understandable. Many places, as you said, tourism is go, has been going down. Uh, and, and sadly, I see some communities going back to the ocean and say like, well, let's, let's go get more. Let's, you know, let's, let's take the protection, protection now. And, and I guess that the, 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 the thing that, I, I kind of I tend to to think of it's like well the 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 fact that we've been protecting this area or, or or the fact that we've been managing these areas in a better way actually allow us now to have food to have food security that food that is not now not coming from the the selling from the other business that now are not working so how important it is to actually save for the future it's saving for the future and, and the fu a future that is continuously showing more and more uncertain. So thank you so much for, for, that, uh, for that answer, Enrique. Um, Madasar, um, communities, we always talk about like, we were just talking about the communities, how, you know, communities are part of this, how, you know, and, and we, we say many things about it, but actually, what do you think about how the communities you know, are benefiting from this uh, conservation, marine conservation, from the things that we're doing, and, and how much part of the decision making process are really in, in the, from your perspective? Thanks, Max. I really appreciate um, Enrique and, and Brandon's and, and Alex's um, points before. So, um, I will answer your question, but I think, you know, just to give a very specific example about communities, I was working with four um, separate communities who share a terrestrial border, um, you know, and they're, they're racking their heads because of course, Palau's main um, revenue stream is through tourism and that has gone from, you know, uh, to, well, it's zero at this point. So they're wondering how they can continue their, um, mandates of patrolling their areas and you know we had this conversation and i said why don't we think about the different technologies that are available and um, work smarter not harder so now they're considering a drone technology that can help them um, monitor this huge terrestrial space that they all share they don't have to to look for funding to purchase fuel that's you know contributing to carbon emissions, um, because the, the, the status quo was to drive up and down their terrestrial areas and look for poachers. And now they can sort of use this technology to, to um, share the, the load and also um, create cost-effective uh, you know, initiatives amongst themselves. And I think you know, that's where uh, conservation investment really benefits these communities. Um, by really creating space for us to think innovatively about what we're actually doing. You know, what is, what is the objective here? And I, I think previous to COVID,